hey everyone good day to you and welcome back to the channel up until now we learned about uh, learned about macros how to define a macro how to use a macro and why to use macros in general it's time to learn about common mistakes that people usually make when working with macros and let's start by the most common one in my opinion which is uh, compile time versus runtime um, it's super easy to uh, forget about run uh, compile time and runtime when you're using Emacs Lisp in the interpreter mode, because uh, just because like the compile time, uh, the compilation stage and execution stage happen at the almost the same time. The interpreter compiles your code and right after that run the compiled code. So you don't, as a user, you really don't notice anything different, but the fact is the compile time is still there like the compilation stage is still there and since we like we didn't talk about the compilation uh, uh, like how to compile the code just yet we're going to talk about it in the future but obviously you can compile your code first and then later in the future run the compile code uh, like when you use a compiler that way uh, you like the distinction between the compile time and the runtime is quite obvious. So uh, sometimes it's really easy to forget about all that. And because of that, usually when people try to define a new macro, they forget about uh, this fact and just without knowing, evaluate some of the logic inside the macro at compile time. But what they actually want to do is to evaluate that logic in runtime. So here we have two macros to like, as an example, the wrong macro here gets one uh, argument, check the argument, whether or not it's nil. And based on the result, it's going to call a function called do something with the side effect, with side effect. Um, right now, if we call this macro uh, at compile time, the interpreter or the compiler, it doesn't matter, will evaluate that, that function in compile time, right? And based on what it might return, uh, runtime would be different, right? But most of the time, some obviously sometimes you want to do it and you intentionally decide to run some logic in compile time, which is fine if you know if you know what you're doing, but most of the time you don't want to do that. You want to return a form that your macro expands into and run that form in the runtime during the runtime. So here's the correct example. Um, it's really similar to the previous one, but we use back code as we discussed in the previous episode uh, to return a form which contains a function call that calls the function do something with side effect and then we mark the uh, argument x to be evaluated and be replaced by its evaluation result so creating a macro macro right like this is going to solve our problem and when we're in compile time uh, nothing special will happen like that function is not going to be evaluated we just return a form which is a function call and then on the runtime uh, we're going like the compiler is going to compile the code in, in a way that in runtime that do something with side effect will be executed uh, again sometimes you want your logic to be run uh, to be run in uh, compile time but most of the time you want it in runtime to give you an example of when you might want to run some logic with side effect, especially uh, in compile time, is um, let's say you have you define a macro that reads a file, and based on the entries in that file, you want to define multiple functions. That makes sense to you know read the file in compile time and have the function defined in compile time and done right, but Again, you need to be, uh, you need to know about the difference between compile time versus runtime before you're defining a macro. Also, just to reiterate, ha like having a side effect in your function is not the key here. 
you still like I wrote uh, the side effect here to kind of uh, show you how it might go wrong but um, even you don't have any side effect in your function you still have to differentiate between compile time versus runtime when you're defining a macro okay the next one uh, is variable capture there's like different names for these mistakes but uh, i'll go with variable cap uh, like i decided to use whatever uh, the elist literature actually refers to them um, variable capture capture is another common one um, i did it many times without knowing um, especially when you have a function and later on during the de development of your module or whatever you decide to turn it into a macro um, that's where you're going to make the mistake so let's have a look at uh, what is it about in general again we have a macro called wrong which takes two arguments the first one is f a form or a function whatever it's, it's an expression uh, that evaluates to a result and then we get a list of expressions and store them in a list called body as you can see here uh, we are returning a new form it starts with the let form we use backcode to put the entire form here we define a local binding called result and we mark f for uh, evaluation in runtime which is like evaluate f whatever it evaluates to store it in the local binding result and then we check for result whether or not it's nil if it wasn't nil uh, evaluate the body otherwise print something in the message box print the result in the message box. while this is perfectly normal like you can't find anything unusual in this form no you you won't see any error when you um, actually evaluate this macro but there's a like a huge problem here let's evaluate this macro first and to, to show you uh, the issue I define a new a variable called result and I store one in it right so variable result here contains number one and then I called wrong I call wrong with number 200 as f so f would be 200 and body will contain only one expression message right so um if i evaluate this uh, macro call here um my intuition is that okay i should see let's actually do this to kind of be really obvious uh so my intu my intuition is that okay i'm going to see number one on the mini buffer right because result contains one obviously but when i evaluate this to my surprise i get 200 by 200 so the reason behind that is that uh our macro will be expand into uh it's going to be expanded into this form here right and since we define a local binding called result uh, um, that local binding res uh, result is going to hide the global variable result that we define here so let's walk through it in compile time the compiler is going to uh, evaluate the macro get the result which is like this form and replace it in the call side so basically um, in the call site we're going to have something like this right uh, f would be replaced by 200 and we can't forget about this for a second right uh, and here it's going to be replaced by this right so this is what is going to uh, happen in compile time our macro is going to be expanded into this form and later in the runtime uh, the compiler or uh, tries to like the interpreter tries to run this form we define a, a variable called result and then right after that we define a local binding called result so obviously here result 
uh, points to this variable in here to this local binding in here uh, and as you can already see we're hiding the global variable this is not uh, the intended thing uh, this is not what we intended for our uh, macro call um, ooh, I messed up the indentation um, actually to to fix this um, we need to make sure that whatever local binding that we define in our macro is unique. So how do we get to do that? There's like a few different functions that uh, we can use, but I'm really a, a huge fan of GenSim. So same macro, we call it correct. Same logic, but we add, a, uh, we add another uh, let bind. Um, let form here and as you can see this let is part of the logic of the macro we're not returning it as the new form we define a local binding called var and we call gensim we store the result in var what does gensim do gensim do it generates a symbol for us a unique symbol that is uninterned what does uninterned means um, uh, like a longer discussion i in, uh, included a link for you to have a look um, but basically we're defining a new unique symbol here and we store it in var and then when we actually write our template write our new form to return uh, instead of using result we're going to mark var as uh, to be evaluated in runtime and use that as uh, or local binding but let's see how gensim actually oh this is it right um to show you how it works same example as before just use the correct macro here so as you can see it returns one as as expected like this is how it should work uh, the result that we're using in our body refers to the global variable rather than the local variable um but gensim is actually uh pretty straightforward when you evaluate it it just returns a symbol every time you evaluate it as you can see it return a new value on bottom left uh, corner um another function that you can use is uh, make symbol that you can pass uh, like a string to it that's it's going to create an uninterned symbol for you uh uninterned symbols are different than normal symbols uh, you can't have access to them normally uh like you do with other symbols uh to learn more about them uh refer to the link that i included in the uh, in this org file i'm going to put it in the comment section down below as well in the description sorry um so that's how uh, variable capture issue um, works basically how to avoid it um another one is many evaluation this happens most of the time as well believe it or not but it's quite simple pretty straightforward um here we have a wrong macro it gets just one argument and in the body we actually use backcode to return an if form if you have a closer look here we have uh, we marked x for evaluation here here and here so in total we marked x for evaluation three times but based on actually here yeah, too but based on the condition here at least uh, not at least we're going to evaluate x exactly twice which is not good um what if x contains some side effect right so we're going to run a function to a, not a function we're going to evaluate an expression twice that might contain side effect that's not good uh it happens quite uh, so frequently um the right way to do it is again like before create a local binding and evaluate x just once store it in a variable and use that variable instead um 
this way we're going to evaluate uh, x only once and just use the result of evaluation um pretty simple uh yet i made that that mistake a few times Ooh, this one is to be honest with you i used to make this mistake quite a lot and when i learned about this issue i was like oh, I had no idea that this can be an issue and this is about evaluating the argument of an of a macro using a form like eval right so uh let's uh, let's uh, have a look at how it works especially uh we have a macro called uh wrong we're, we're defining a set q um form but we evaluate directly evaluate the argument x using eval form uh, in our body uh, which is not right uh, I'm going to tell you why uh, the right way to do it is to mark X like this to be evaluated in runtime um, because basically when we call eval here eval here it's going to happen in compile time in compile time we're going to evaluate X but when we mark it to be evaluated we're going to uh, evaluate it in runtime there's a huge difference um basically when like in the wrong macro when we call it eval at that time the color uh, context is not even populated right so we can run, uh, run into issues you might use it and it work uh and it works and it doesn't it might not seem uh like an issue which uh it was the thing that i used to do but the fact is um you can run into issues that you can uh, easily uh, find out about um to avoid that basically it's better to avoid using eval at all in your uh, macro body just mark it to be evaluated in uh, runtime and you'll be grand i included a link again uh, for you to read more about this issue um, but basically it's simple just don't use eval in your uh, macro body so um, this one was the last one that I decided to include in uh, this episode with this episode uh, like we almost covered uh, most of the basics that you need to know about Elise to uh, start working on Emacs not Emacs, I mean to use Emacs. Um, so we're in good, uh, we're in good ground to uh, start uh, talking about more editor-specific functionalities of Elisp. And um, from the next episode onward, we're going to talk about some functionalities and features of Elisp that is related to uh, the editor itself, like package management. We're going to learn about buffers. I, I don't know, like we're going to start creating an actual editor based on Emacs list. Um, it's kind of exciting. Um, if you have any feedback, uh, please share. If you have any idea about this video series, please share with me. You can comment uh, in the comment section. And if you like my work, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel. Uh, like always, thank you so much for watching and see you in the next episode.